Today we're going to talk about the aorta. And that's kind of a very important organ for all of us who wants to stay alive. And uh, when you are fortunate to practice in an institution like we are here, clearly a lot of the detailed assessment of the aorta nowadays is done by either uh, CT, particularly using the new gated CT scanners, and or MRI. So I want to make sure that we have plenty of time for um, Faisal to talk about that because I think it's a lot of the details that we need nowadays, we get them from that imaging. Having said that though, echo is so widely used that not uncommonly, the first suspicion of something wrong with the aorta comes through an ultrasound test, through an echo. And even in situations of uh, dissections, because patients come in with all kinds of atypical symptoms, often the first test that may be ordered is an echo. And then whoop, you get suspicious, and then you proceed with whatever else uh, you have in your armamentarium. In addition, when you finish your practice, you may, all, all, you may not all be as lucky as some of us to be able to stay here and practice. You may go to different places, and you'll be at the mercy of what those places have from the point of view of CT technology, MRI, whether, whether read by radiologists, cardiologists, or whatnot. So to have a very strong basis on how to use echocardiography can be very helpful. So what I'd like to cover with you is imaging views, something about serial measurements, because we do that in the office, aortic dissection, and one entity that actually ECHO is actually very good with is aortic debris, or ateromas, which with TE, uh, we actually do get a beautiful view of it. So in terms of views, most of the aorta can be seen by transthoracic echocardiography, if you're lucky. Um, certainly the aortic root uh, is almost universally seen, unless you have somebody with a very, very poor window. So that one we see all the time. And uh, we see the, the uh, annulus of the uh, aortic valve and then the, the uh, sanus of Arsalva, where we can make our measurements of aortic root. The ascending aorta needs a little uh, extra work by either angulating uh, upwards or sliding the whole transducer up a little bit so we can see that portion of the ascending aorta, which is very important for detection of ascending aortic aneurysms. The arch, really, we see the upper part and descending portions of the arch. We don't do a very good job with the ascending portion of the arch. That's a lot more difficult to see. Sometimes if somebody has a wonderful window, one can see it, but that's an area that frequently is silent. So the distal ascending aorta and the proximal portion of the aortic arch are frequently silent to the transthoracic echo, where the lower portions of the arch, beginning of descending aorta, is often quite visible from a suprasternal approach. Now the descending Thoracic aorta is a little more tricky. That's done from a parasternal approach, but by turning the, the transducer halfway from a, from a long axis to a short axis. So if you go from a long axis to a short axis very quickly, you'll never get it. But if you go slowly, you will become parallel. Remember, what you want to be is parallel to the esophagus or parallel to the spine so that you can then see uh, that segment of the thoracic aorta. And then, of course, the abdominal aorta, that is more often seen than not. So that one also, we get a, a chance of being able to see. With TE, we do a little better job, because the TE gives us very crisp and clear views of uh, the aortic root, the ascending aorta, which I like to get myself at about 100 degrees uh, that's when you get a, a very nice view, and then you just simply pull the probe up gradually, and you see a good chunk of the ascending aorta until you get to the blind spot <coughs> where the trachea is, and the air in the trachea gives you artifacts, and that's your so-called blind spot. The descending aorta from the upper portion of the abdomen, around the stomach area, sometimes even a little lower, all the way up to the arch, 
in 99% of patients, it's going to be very, very visible, very easy to see, to look at the aorta, to size the vessel, to look at the wall, um, look for ateromas, clots, dissections, and so on. And then as we go up to this region from the esophagus, again, we can see the distal, the um, proximal portion of the arch much better by TEE than what we can by transoratic. And we see very nicely the whole arch, including the arch itself, descending portion of the arch, and so on. But always a little blind spot somewhere in here where we may not be able to catch by either this view here or this one here. So there's always that area where we could potentially lose a very localized type of pathology that is happening in that area. So this is a 55-year-old fellow with an ascending aortic aneurysm. Um, he's had previous uh, CTs and even CMR, and, and it's at 48 millimeters. So the question is, do you do a CMR, a CT every single year to keep an eye of this 48 millimeter? Or do you do annual screening with echo, and then whenever you're suspicious that a change has happened, maybe then you do the CT? Uh, as you know, uh, CMR is fairly benign from the point of view of side effects, other, other than people that have uh, kidney failure. But CT, you know, you, you start thinking about how many CTs people should get and radiation and all that. And also cost. So this fellow here has a very nice uh, view of the ascending aorta, and it is exactly 48 millimeters. So in someone like this one, I would be perfectly comfortable with an annual assessment by ECHO, and if I see any concern, no problem. Switch to the CMR or the MRI, whichever of those tests in the past has been. And that limits cost, uh, and it limits potential radiation if you are using CT. So um, numbers. So uh, to no surprise, the aortic root and the ascending aorta uh, change with body size, so children will have different numbers than adults. And this came from that wonderful document uh, that came out about three years ago on quantification measurements of echocardiography, which was an update of a previous document. And this one, they really did a very nice job pro, uh, with tables and figures. And this is one of their figures that shows how the aorta changes with body surface area. So, you know, in older adults, as we often see in our practice, you may get aortas of 4.1, 4.2, and still be within normal range if the person is a giant, you know, with a 2.4 RBSA. So every time that we make a measurement of the ascending aorta, aortic root, keep in mind the size of the person. Because likewise, a very small uh, person or woman with a BSA of 1.5 or so, uh, would be already concerning uh, something like 3.6, 3.7. Uh, younger people have smaller aortas. So again, if you have a young 25-year-old with an aorta of, let's say, 3.6, and if somebody is a, is a nice uh, young woman, uh, you would be concerned. So you have to keep all those uh, concepts in mind when you're looking at, um, at sizing. Now, in terms of recommendations for elective repair, and, and, and I wouldn't be surprised if, if Faisal also has a slide on that. Um, you know, when we're following people who are happy, they don't have any symptoms other than a diagnosis of an ascending aortic aneurysm, usually um, it's between 5 and 5.5 is at gray zone. Beyond 5.5, most, most uh, surgeons, cardiologists would recommend elective repair. Um, when people are in that gray zone, they usually recommend between biannual and annual assessment, again, depending on the track record the patient has of serial changes. I have a very nice African-American man now that I've been following for God knows about eight or nine years, and he's right at 5.4, 5.5, and 5, close to 5.5, hasn't blink, blink an eye in eight or nine years. So I have, I have you know, I'm not doing it every six months anymore. Uh, initially I did until I figured out that he was very stable and then I put myself, I, I put him on an annual surveillance. So you have to make a judgment call on that regard. 
Likewise, some people use the correction for BSA, which makes it easier in terms of, and, then, and that the number is uh, 2.75 centimeters per meter square, or a fast rate of expansion. So if somebody is changing at a rate of half a centimeter per year, that's concerning. And that's, again, the importance now of being very reliable in your technology. If it's going to be echocardiography, then sonographers have to be very, very careful how they do this so that we know exactly the views are reproducible, the measurements are reproducible, and so on. And, and likewise with CT or CMR. I mean, just, you know, we do great work here. That doesn't mean that everywhere else in the world people are as careful. So it's very important when you're in practice, if you're going to follow these things, that, that you have a comfort with whatever technique you are using and the people who are imaging and measuring because a change of 0.5 per year could be a, a red, red uh, signal for uh, doing something about it. And if it was technical, you're sending somebody prematurely uh, for uh, an operation. Caveat, this comes from ACCHA guidelines. Patients with Marfa syndromes or other genetically mediated disorders like Ehlers Danlos, Turners, and by, even by cosmic valves should undergo elective operation at smaller diameters, depending on the condition, and they have a special section for that. And, the, and that because some of those conditions have a much higher risk of rupturing or dissecting. So if you're following a Marfans and they are, let's say, at 4.5, 4.6, you might start getting a little bit more nervous than if it's a just run-of-the-mill 60-year-old um, person with uh, just uh, a saccular aneurysm. So those are one of the caveats that they do mention. And um, all these numbers are based on this type of observations, where at numbers under 5, there's a fair amount of stability, uh, and then beyond that, you have an issue with a more higher rate of, uh, of ruptures, which is, of course, a very chaotic situation because when <laughs> an aneurysm ruptures, it's very, very unlikely that uh, patients can be saved. So going out towards dissections, and um, everybody in this room is familiar with either Stanford, A for ascending, B for uh, descending, and the Debeke classification, which takes the ascending uh, dissections and breaks them into one where it starts proximally and then dissects past the area of the subclavian and keeps going down towards the descending aorta ending anywhere. It could end somewhere here, down in the, in the abdomen, or down in the legs, in the iliacs. Or the type 2, which is localized to the proximal, uh, to somewhere in the arch, but doesn't go beyond the subclavian. So this would be both as type A, but this, would, this is called type 2 for the Becky because it makes you that distinction that is only as, and why is that important? That's why do we like the Becky classification? Very importantly, because when you take care of a type 1, acutely surgically, which is a treatment, we all agree, type 1s and types 2, unless there is some other reasons not to operate, patients should go to surgery. Now, today to surgery, maybe in three or four years for stent, because as you know, we are privileged in this institution to be testing one of the stents that could be used in the ascending aorta. So, you know, stay tuned because technology changes. Now, when you take care of a type one or type two, what do you do? You convert them to a type three. Uh, not the type two, I'm sorry, a type one. When you take care of a type one, you leave this behind. Somebody comes in with a type 3, if they're having no complications, today, treatment is medical. Today, again, interesting debate going on because the endo endovascular technologies are progressing so rapidly that there's a group of vascular surgeons that are uh, beginning to talk about maybe taking all type 3s and putting a, uh, an endovascular graft. But that's, again, stay tuned for that discussion. Currently, what is usually recommended for a type 3 is that we treat them medically and then follow them over time to see if they develop complications with the false lumen expanding, becoming more aneurysmal, having a late risk of rupture at which time you would do an elective repair of that. 
So if you take care of a type one, you convert them into a type three, and they will need very similar follow-up as a type three. And that's one of the reasons where I personally, I think many, many here advocate and prefer the, the Becky classification because we made a distinction between one and two than the Stanford that just simply says A for ascending and B for, for descending. As I said earlier, echocardiography frequently can be the first test that is ordered. And this was <laughs> such a case. This was a lady that came in with chest pain, but it was kind of a really funny feeling. She didn't feel too good. Uh, there was a constellation of findings, and she basically was put in the, um, in the ICU um, for management, uh, actually under an uh, internal medicine service, um, and they asked for an echo. And I happened to be rounding. It was a Saturday. I happened to be rounding. Those were the days I was younger and rounded on weekends. And uh, the, the, the sonographer, I can remember, maybe, uh, I think it was you. I think it was you. Was it you? Yeah, we're talking 10 years ago. <laughs> page me, page me and say, Dr. Q, I think I have a dissection here. So I walked over to the bedside. We looked at it right there, and this was her echo with a dilated uh, root and a nice intimal flap here. She also had some AI. And this lady, uh, we page, uh, this Dr. Reardon was available. And um, this is the rest of her transthoracic, okay? I showed you earlier this view of the descending aorta with a flap there. So clearly she was a type one going down to descending aorta. And she actually went from, bed, from bedside to the OR. No more test. Of course, in the OR then, while she was being put to sleep, a TE probe was passed, and you know, you, you can take, take more, uh, but she literally went from bedside to the OR. Uh, she's still alive, and she, I see her every six months. She's very grateful for everybody who took care of her so promptly. Now, usually we have a little bit more time to go ahead in the bedside and do a TE, and most dissections have a common look, as you see here. There is this intimal flap with chaotic motion, um, and this is a type one, this is a type two that ends up right here at the arch. These are different patients. Here we see one starting after the subclavian, so this would be a type three. So what are the false negatives? False negatives are very few. In fact, it is very, very accurate. Uh, mostly it's the blind spot. So if you have a tiny, small dissection, very, very localized to that area where we have the blind spot, potentially you could miss it. I have to tell you, I don't even remember if we've ever had such a case. Um, so the blind spot, I think, is, is, the, is the, biggest, the biggest issue. And intramural hematomas, if they're very small, I'll show you some pictures later, they can be missed too sometimes. Because intramural hematoma basically is a thickening of the wall. And sometimes that can be tricky to make sure, you know, is it really or not? Uh, the good news is that if you're suspicious, you have time to then move on to another imaging modality. False positive are mostly reverberation artifacts. Um, now, sometimes an aortic aneurysm with a thrombus could look like, but I, again, I think with a little bit of experience, you wouldn't do that. You wouldn't be confused there. The biggest problem is an artifact, like that. See that there? Okay, so is that a dissection or is that a reverberation of this wall? Okay. So this was, I think, one of the best papers that really put that uh, uh, to rest. Uh, this was from a group in Barcelona. I know him, he's a great guy, very, very smart. And they had this publication in Jack uh, basically 20 years ago. And they basically suggested that the best way to look at this artifact is with an end mode. So here we have this little thing here flopping. Is this a dissection, yes or no? So you bring your end mode and put it in there. And you can see that what looks like a flap having a very concordant motion with the wall of the aorta. And that tells you that 99% likelihood it's an artifact, it's a reverberation of the wall. Now here you have another one that may look 
like an artifact. It's actually very soft, you know, that potential, but it has a little bit more chaotic motion of its own, a little more. Now, when you get these type of things, obviously you're not going to just put your, all your eggs in that particular basket so you get more views. So what, see how it looks in short axis. And now that we have the X-plane, you can clearly put your X-plane right there and get a beautiful short axis of it. See, now it looks more like a flap. It has its own movement, independent of the wall. And now in the arch, we see this other thing right here, flipping in the arch. So this is a type two, okay? So, but if I show you only this and nothing else, you still will always be, ah, I think it's a dissection, but I, I'd like to see more. So it's just like everything else, you know, you want to have multiple views. So in most cases, if you have a type one dissection, all you need for guys therapy is the diagnosis because the mortality is so high that in general, once you know they have it, you need to go to surgery. Now, other things you do want to know is how big the aortic root is because you may then need to, to do a, a composite graft, for example. If somebody has a big root, like the patient I showed you, she ended up with a composite graft, where she had a prosthetic valve and a graft all put together. So you need to know the aortic root. You need to look for aortic valve abnormalities, great the severity of AR. Uh, is it uh, valvular AR? Is it because the annulus are being dilated from the aortic root, like happened to her? The annulus was dilated because she had chronic aortic root dilatation that had been missed, and then the dissection, so she ended up with a valve. Or is it a flap that is prolapsing, as I'll show you later, and is causing the AI, in which case that can be repaired just by repairing the dissection. And very importantly, pericardial effusions. Any pericardial effusion that you see is a kiss of death if you don't act very quickly. There, truly, when you see a pericardial effusion, you're talking about you need to be in the OR in minutes. We lost a patient like that. At the bedside, a little bit of effusion, surgeon was walking in, we were discussing it, and right there in front of us, the patient went down, died. We could not, we pumped it on him, took him to the OR, patient died. Um, so any effusion is really like, <laughs> this is not time for discussion. It's time for running, assuming you have an OR available and a surgeon. Um, this is just for fun. You can take the uh, TE probe and put it in the neck and scan the carot carotids if you want to. Um, so this guy looks like a lot of AI, but you can see here that it's a flap that is prolapsing. So in these cases, you take care of the dissection and the AI will, will be okay. You don't have to necessarily uh, replace the aortic valve. In a type B, most of the time, you're going to put them to rest, treat them medically, and have some time to do more imaging, do other things, unless you see potential complications. A, one would be vital organs in trouble, and one of the, the two vital organs that can be in trouble frequently are kidney and gut. So those are troublemakers. But if you don't have signs of those, patient is relatively comfortable, the treatment so far is medical, unless, although I told you a minute ago, they stay tuned because the endovascular guys are beginning to, to propose that maybe uh, stenting should be done a little earlier. And then once you take care of them medically, you follow them for expansion of the force lumen and all the other things that could require elective repair later, and Faisal, I'm sure, will touch on that a lot more. However, Sometimes things can happen. And if this is a patient that looks like a straightforward type three, this is your false lumen here. I mean, true lumen here and the false lumen there. Always when you see a lot more pulsation, uh, that's the true lumen usually, and slow flow is usually in the false lumen. But look what happened as we proceed. There's this little thing here. And as we move, nowadays we would do an X-plane and make it even faster. You can see that all of this is basically if false aneurysm with thrombus. So true lumen, false lumen, the false lumen perforated, patient didn't die because there was thrombus around that form, and this is basically at the time of admission, the patient already is having uh, a contained rupture requiring obviously emergent intervention. A word about intramural hematomas. Uh, what are they? Well. Interesting, these are some of the thoughts. 
a rupture of the vasa vasorum or a spontaneous intimomedial tear are the two proposed mechanisms other than, of course, catheter trauma, which obviously can happen. But notice that it's a whole different story now. What you have is this area where you have a hematoma with blood. So it looks like almost a thrombus, right? It looks like you have an aorta with a, with a clot. But this is intramural, okay? So CTs and MRI give you really very pretty pictures. Ultrasound can give you pretty pictures too, like you have here, okay? You can see the ultrasound and the CT on this patient. These are taken from this nice article by Song. However, if this is a very small area, you can see how you could miss this. Now, the classical teaching has been descending aorta intramural hematomas, treat medically, type A's, or ascending aorta arch intramural hematoma, uh, treat them like a dissection, like a type A dissection, and, and go to surgery. However, again, that's been challenged more recently because there have been studies showing that these patients can be treated medically and uh, there is uh, healing. So again, I, I, this is not, I don't think it's as dogmatic as it is for dissections that a type one, type two should go to surgery. Uh, there is still, there's some people here suggesting that patient is stable, um, that they could be treated with blood pressure reduction, beta blockers, and, and, and follow imaging to see if it's healing. Um, this is one condition that we can miss. If they're small, if they're in a, in a close to a blind spot. So when, we are, when you're doing TEs in situations where there's suspicion for a section, be very sensitive to a thickening in an area of the wall of the aorta that you are not expecting. And go back, take multiple views, because that could be, that could be an intramural hematoma. Um, this is a different condition. This fellow came in with severe back pain. And you can see an aorta. This is at the, at the epigastric level. This is below the diaphragm. A lot of calcium. This is an old fellow. Well, actually, not an old. But uh, his blood vessels were very old. A lot of calcium, a lot of atherosclerosis. And then you have this area here. And that's thrombus there. This is clot. And basically, this is a break. Okay? And that is what is called a penetrating ulcer. Actually, you can see this very nice uh, figure for, from this article here, almost identical to this picture in this patient. And this, likewise, can break and produce either false aneurysms or full rupture and death. So they're considered also surgical emergencies. Uh, and this fellow did go to surgery. Uh, I think Dr. Sogby did this TE, I remember. A uh, long time ago. <laughs> So uh, they don't grow in trees, they don't, but uh, when they come and you pick them up, uh, I'm, I'm assuming, I sus you know, this, this will be detected by any, any of the three te techniques, T, CT, or MR, I think would, would pick them up. The clues are a lot of atherosclerosis. They always have severe atherosclerosis of the aorta, and then you see this area with a break, and then, of course, echogenic material, which is clot. Finally, ateromas. We see a lot of them when we're doing routine TEs. Um, and the grading basically is normal, grade one. Grade two, it shows some thickening of the wall. Grade three is when it's, it's more protruding, and you can have also areas of irregularity. And grade four, of course, is you know, uh, more than five millimeters, uh, usually extensive and with a lot of irregular borders. It's a type of classification that is almost like you know it when you see it, because it's, it's pretty, pretty evident. And this is, again, um, and you can see here, a great uh, three or four with a crater here, where an idus, this would be a perfect place for a thrombus to be. And notice this one having a little mobile fragment there. See that? Little tiny mobile fragment there. Here you see one where you see a suspicion area, and this is where the X-plane really is great because you can put it right there, and you can see that there's a big raised plaque, big raised localized ateromas. This is grade four, but notice a little thing there, wiggling there. And this is a lot more wiggling. That's when you go, whoa, who's playing there? So 
you can go from tiny, tiny, tiny little fragments that move to a little more bigger linear fragment to these kind of things, which is like, what the heck? Okay. All of these things, initially, for a while, people um, theorized of what they were. And then uh, studies were done. One of them was done here by Dr. Zogby and uh, was it uh, Nathan? Baguna Nathan? Yeah. And basically, what they did is that these people uh, would go to surgery, some of them, and we would document at surgery that, that these things were thrombus. So they're clots, basically. Most of the time, these are clots. And <laughs> so, so, Bill, you have a professional grandchild now. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> That's terrific. That's terrific, having professional grandchildren. So this is from the article, and uh, you can see these are thrombus. So I think nowadays it's pretty much the teaching is that when you see these flying objects there, usually they are they're thrombi. Now, the problem is what to do with them. Um, and there's been very few randomized trials. Uh, there's not a very good answer. Warfarin, there's been observational studies that suggested that warfarin would work. But then there was this ARCH trial where warfarin was uh, compared to um, clopidogrel and aspirin, and clopidogrel and aspirin had less events in follow-up, 7.6 versus 11 for warfarin. And then there were two trials, Match and Charisma, that showed that no benefit between combined aspirin and clopidogrel or, or aspirin or clopidogrel alone. So now the American College of Physicians recommendations is statins because there is being also some observational data that suggests that statins may reduce outcome events and either aspirin or clopidogrel. So that's the current recommendation. It doesn't mean that it's wonderful. It doesn't mean that these people do great. Uh, they still have a considerable amount of possible events. Um, going for surgery will, is considered extremely aggressive unless you have uh, a very malignant type of uh, aorta looking. And nowadays with stents, stay tuned. This could be potentially another one of the situations where perhaps the vascular surgeons may consider putting some stents when you have this very, very significant um, at the Romans with clots, but stay tuned because that's not again yet. So I'd like to stop here and give plenty of time to um, Faisal so that he can talk about CMR and CT, given the importance today when we take care of these patients. Uh, on the theme, I'll be discussing the largest uh, artery in the human body and some of the different disease states that affect uh, this, um, this um, uh, the aorta. And uh, we've discussed a little bit about transthoracic echocardiogram, and of course my role is CT and MRI. So why CT and MRI? Uh, there's a lot of the same reasons why this technique is used for uh, other uh, indications as well. You know, you can first image the entire aorta in one setting um, with, you know, uh, with these, you can look at these structures with very fine spatial resolution now. And probably one of the most important things is, is that not only can you look at the aorta in, with two-dimensional techniques, but with advanced post-processing that you all have seen in the lab, we can actually evaluate 3D data sets using um, Im advanced image processing such as MPRs, MIPS, and volume rendered images. And all of these give us clues and insights into what the aorta looks like, uh, what the pathologies are, and actually also have, help the surgeon kind of visualize what the treatment needs to be and the planning that will go on into it. So, um, uh, so you know, therefore, you know, the, the, why these techniques are so necessary when evaluating the aorta. And with some techniques, such as with CT, you actually get more information just the aorta. You know you can see all the surrounding structures with it as well. And in some disease states like aortic dissection, this actually becomes exceptionally important. So um, some of the things I'll definitely be covering are, uh, you know, la uh, lap over with what Dr. Q was mentioning. Uh, 
Uh, there's been a lot of recent guidelines that for um, us and the vascular surgeons, the imagers and the vascular surgeons, on you know what a good CT report should encompass. And this is kind of um, one of the tables in those manuscripts, which really describes where all the specific, if you are going to evaluate the aorta, where specific measurements need to be made um, for, for the structures you're following. And of course, these would be done for every time the patient was sent back to the lab to see whether there's been any you know, increase in size of the aorta. These exact same measurements would have to be uh, repeated and then actually also compared to the prior measurements. So um, a lot of this I hope you all have, who have been through the nuclear and MR, uh, CT and MRI labs, you all have seen we're kind of very particular about these measurements when it is an aortic case. Um, I won't labor too much in it, but it's a lot of the same measurements you all have heard, the sinus of Vesava, the sinotubular junction, the ascending aorta, some measurements in the aortic arch, uh, the proximal, uh, the, the isthmus of the aorta, the mid-descending and the distal descending at the, the, uh, the crux uh, where it enters into the abdomen. So um, um, I'm just going to skip over this, but one of the things that I hope you all saw from Dr. Q's talk was that, you know, the aorta varies in size, and it's kind of important to have an idea of what normal is. But in this table, I just wanted to show you is that if, on average, if you were to look at the dimensions of the different structures of the aorta, the ascending aortic aorta is usually the largest structure. So the, the aortic sinus is usually the next largest, and from then on there, from the ascending aorta, the aorta gradually normally tapers. Now, there's a lot of different um, handouts that you can pick up that kind of give you what a normal aortic size is. A couple of things that you have to keep in mind, these are, of course, averages. You really have to be aware of the imaging techniques that were used to come up with these values. And more importantly, what Dr. Q showed is that it really depends on patient characteristics as well. You saw graphs, and this is a, my, a, a graph, a similar graph, where you know, these aortic measurements actually vary as the patient ages, and in general, things get larger as we age. Similarly, this is one that looks at body surface area. You can see the bigger your patient is, you would expect their aortic measurements to be um, concomitantly big as well. And this is just one of those graphs that can kind of help, um, kind of help you to determine whether the measurements you're measuring are normal for this patient or not. Now, um, one thing that I recently came across, um, and I know we don't normally um, report this, that, and that's because a lot of the guidelines have very strict measurements of when to perform surgery. But if you're measuring the aortic root, as we often do with echo or CT, um, there's actually a Z-score you can calculate from the Marfan's website. And I think, you know, it may be of interest to actually the referring surgeon to know as a standard deviation where this patient's aortic sinus actually relates um, um, compared to, you know, a large population. So I just recently came across that and I was sitting there Googling it and it's very easy. You just put in a few information, it calculates the patient's BSA. You put in the measurement that you got and what technique you were using and it'll give you a Z-score. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Now, when it comes to CT, one of the most important, obviously, with measurements are so critical to the management of our patients, we have to do it correctly. Uh, this is just one of those tables that we've talked about a lot, you have heard a lot. It's really, really important to gate your EKG to the EKG cycle. Um, and the reason is the ascending aorta and the aortic root in particular are very susceptible to pulsation artifacts. And this is a great example of one you know, where oftentimes you'll get reports, you know, where, you know, things are enlarged. And if you don't look a little bit further or look at your images yourself, if there is a lot of pulsation artifact, you can completely, you know, you, you have this double lumen artifact. I've seen these studies being called dissections, you know, incorrect measurements. It's really important to gate to the EKG. Uh, less so of an issue for abdominal measurements, for descending thoracic aortic measurements, because they don't change as much, but the aortic root and ascending aorta are the, are the most susceptible. How do we make measurements? This is also very important. Uh, you all know that we use a double oblique method, so we're truly trying to create uh, 
a nice short axis of the aorta. So in two views, you know, in sagittal and coronal, we really try to go perpendicular to the flow of blood to create a short axis slice. And then we're measuring, remember with CT and MRI, the external diameter. So this is from outside to outside, right? So from wall to wall. And why do you do that? Well, the reason is, is you know, this, if the gold standard is what the, 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 what the surgeon would, um, um, the clip the surgeon would put around the aorta as the actual measurement, well, then the, you know, we should measure similarly. So actually measuring from the outer border of that uh, arterial wall to the outer border of the arterial wall will mimic what the surgeon would use with his calipers in the operating room. Now, this is just a great uh, I example of if you were to just use our normal uh, axial slices to make a measurement. You can see this, is, this aortic aorta is very tortuous. And if you were to just make a straightforward you know, cross-section of the aorta, you'd get almost 11.8 centimeters. Now, if you were to take that same aorta and make a proper um, um, a, a coaxial view, where you're orthogonal in two different planes, you can see the measurement is very different. Yes, it's still severely enlarged, but it's you know not a fearsome uh, 12 centimeter aorta. But just giving you the idea that if you're not going to take the effort to truly be coaxial to the aorta, you will overestimate measurements. Um, Modern day uh, software such as with CT now really have made this very easy. You know that. All the segments of the heart can, that can be segmented, and basically the computer can create a center line for you of what it thinks is the aorta. Most of the time it's very accurate, and you can really create, you know, it'll, it'll, it'll be perfectly in the center line. You'll get these, you know, you can move this bar on the top right-hand side, go to the, where you feel the aortic, uh, aorta looks the largest. You'll have a perfect cross-section, and you can make measurements. So this is, you know, actually um, very routinely done and is quite simple, and can actually maybe, uh, you know, reduce uh, variability between two operators. So these are just from the guidelines. Um, again, stressing the importance of using uh, these advanced imaging techniques at reproducible landmarks to make measurements and to use the external diameters. Um, okay. So I'm just going to kind of jump into the different disease states. One of the disease states we'll begin with is, of course, aneurysms. And here we'll be discussing thoracic aneurysms. Now, believe it or not, this is not an uncommon cause of death. It's the 18th most common cause of death. We know it can be silent. How many studies have we done or echoes we've gotten where, you know, you've, you've found enlargement of the aorta? Uh, aortic disease is increasing in prevalence. Uh, it has the same risk factors as coronary disease, an aging population um, with multiple uh, cardiac risk factors. But one of the things that we'll learn more about is really the, 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 path, the, the, path, the pathology is different for the ascending aorta versus the descending aorta. And, um, um, what we'll learn is that ascending thoracic aortic aneurysms actually have a very strong genetic component. So these are disease states where, you know, the classic disease states such as bicuspid aortic valves, Marfan's, Louis Dietz, Erlos Daniels, uh, Turner's, Noonan's, um, and cer certain familial families who have uh, a genetic uh, a disorder, you know, you'll have a, a thoracic aortic aneurysms. Very, very different from the descending aorta. The descending aorta is much more susceptible to atherosclerosis, and there you have, uh, you know, aneurysms that are due to um, atherosclerosis rather than a genetic disorder. And this is just a slide that you know all, that are readily available, going over some of the genetic defects associated with different genetic syndromes that I had mentioned that lead to thoracic aortic aneurysms, ascending thoracic aortic aneurysms. And in those families who have thoracic aortic aneurysms, there's certain gene defects that can also, uh, these families have, that can also be determined and actually are important for then screening first degree relatives. So again, this is just a slide showing you how disease above the ligamentum or, you know, in the ascending thoracic aorta, which tends to be due to uh, 
medial degeneration due to genetic disorders is very different from below the ligamentum, which is an atherosclerotic disease. Now, here's an example uh, just with imaging. Um, here are two axial slice um, image and then the volume rendered image where you can actually rotate the image and you know, um, in a 360 degrees to look at it from different angles. And you can see a large ascending thoracic aorta. And maybe, you know, if you could see the root a little bit better, you'd say, you know, there's definite effacement of the sinotubular junction as well. And if you look closer, you know, um, it's so important that in these studies that we do is when you do have enlargements of the ascending aorta, you know, a very simple cause for it can be a bicuspid aortic valve. And this is just a reminder that, you know, if you can look just a little bit below and, you know, at the valve, you may very well make the diagnosis of what is wrong with this patient. Um, um, so, and these are just screening recommendations. As, as you know, with those with patients who have bicuspid valves, it's very important to screen first degree relatives. Now, um, what is the association in ascending aortic um, aneurysms and the risk of complications such as rupture, dissection, or death? And this is, uh, you can see the, the, the different uh, graphs here. The different colorings are different sizes. The most important is, I guess, if you look at the very right-hand side of your screen, you can see there's a tremendous increase risk of all complications once the aorta reaches about six centimeters. So that's kind of where we, you know, uh, where complications start, are, 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 are much more um, likely to occur. This is just another graph which also kind of points to, um, shows that you can see as the ascending aortic enlarges, there is some increase in events and uh, aortas above five, but it really, the complications really take off once you hit about six centimeters. And if you look at the descending aorta, it's a little bit different. You know, you can, complications start around five as well, but really, really take off after about seven centimeters. This is just um, a graph that, uh, instead of looking at size as, uh, as a risk factor for complications, this is looking at total survival. And here for the thoracic aorta, again, I think, I hope you'll appreciate that, you know, six centimeters is kind of a, a number where we all very much worry. Um, um, and I, yeah. Um, there are, when we make these measurements, there are a, a lot of these things now can be very nicely um, um, indexed to some no, sort of normogram, and this is just one example of that. This takes into account the patient's BSA. And as you can see, just similar to what Dr. Q had said, you know, you, at least by this table, an 8% per year risk is considered moderate risk, and that's about at 2.75 centimeters B, B, per BSA, whereas a severe risk, about 20% per year, is about 4 centimeters per BSA. So this can kind of very nicely help you determine what you, the risk of your patient is based on these nomograms. Yes? I have a question about this index. It seems the reason of the risk of rupture is based off of Correct? Yes. So why would it matter if you're a small BSA or a large BSA when it's the diameter and the different strength or you know, stresses on the wall? Yeah. No, I, I think I, I, I see what you're saying. For example, if you look at actual recommendations by the guidelines, they make a hard cutoff for you know, ascending aortic aneurysms that are due to some genetic disease at 5.5 you know, centimeters. Whereas for the, you know, uh, I, I'm sorry, uh, for degenerative etiologies at 5.5 centimeters, whereas in those patients who have some sort of genetic condition, as Dr. Q has showed you, between four, four, four and a half to five centimeters. So why did I show you all those graphs in the beginning where I show you the aorta varies uh, with age, it varies with BSA, I show you this normogram, yet the guidelines recommend surgery at a fixed number. Uh, that's a great question. Um, I think if you notice, a lot of the problems uh, occur around six centimeters, and you can see a lot of the cutoffs are a little bit earlier than that. They want to try to prevent complications. But Dr. Q, any idea why we use absolute sizes instead of normograms? Yeah, I, I think number one, the normogram helps you most with 
B, this is theoretical, but it's possible that when we look at the universe of people that get in trouble, they tend to be bigger people, and therefore there may not be enough data to be smaller people. So it may be that a lot of this magic, six being a magic number, maybe because the average person ends up being a total is often somebody with a BSA or let's say 1.8 or higher. So these tiny little ladies that maybe are 1.5, 1.6, probably are not, there's not enough data in there. So I think that that creates a little bit of a dichotomy between having all these normalizing uh, numbers and at the end of the day, having a fixed number to be right. Part of this could be, all these guidelines are based on observation. So and if the majority of your observational group are people with DSA with 1.8 or higher, or whatever, then that kind of moves the needle towards that. That's my theory. Yeah, right. yeah I mean, this doesn't make a lot of sense if, I mean, the risk of rupture shouldn't matter. All it should matter would be the size of the vessel. Well, no, because if you, surrounding if, you, if you are uh, the size of uh, our esteemed fellow, your aorta should be 2.83. So it could be that for her body size and her blood pressure and her cardiac output and everything else, an increase to a, to a, a smaller absolute value might be putting enough stress in that person to potentially put it at risk. Potentially, I mean, we're yeah. going to yeah. 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 So it could be very good because, you know, remember cardiac output, blood pressure, all these things influence how much, you know, stress that occurs in the world. So, It's a great point, and you know, it, we, we, we should probably ask John one day to see what their opinion is. But I, it, it is curious that, yes, we had report absolute sizes, but you know, um, if it gives you any insight into your patient, you know, that, oh my, this, this aorta, you know, if Alpinas is 2.8 and it's now, you know, 3.8, that, you know, and her, you know, she's in the moderate range, uh, maybe you worry a little bit more, you know. Um, but it's all great thoughts. Um, okay, so I'll just quickly get to aortic, uh, acute aortic syndromes. Uh, this is really where the, you know, where the real value of CT also lies and MRI. Um, this is a nice graphic. These, these aortic, acute aortic syndromes is a, a, a name that's given to three different disease entities, aortic dissection, intramural hematoma, and penetrating aortic ulcers. And the reason for it is because they often share the same pathophysiology. Um, not only do they often share the same pathophysiology, but they actually often present with very similar symptoms. So we all know the typical symptoms. These patients can present with chest pain, back pain, um, depending on if they have organ malperfusion, a whole host of other symptoms such as abdominal pain, stroke-like symptoms, and syncope. Uh, basic pathophysiology is really um, essentially this, um, similar between the disease processes as well. You generally have weakening of the media and um, in all of these conditions. So different conditions that predispose to weakening of the media will eventually lead to aneurysmal uh, and dilation of the aorta, aneurysmal formation, and eventually one of these three uh, complications. So I will start with man the first year. We'll go easy. 
What's the, in the IRAD registry, so this was an acute dissection registry, what was the number one cause of uh, dissection? Number one cause. Hypertension. Hypertension. So hypertension, believe it or not, is... For acute dissection. But uh, point being is that from that registry, we learned a lot of different causes for a, a dissection. I'll, I'll hint on those. But main thing was hypertension leads to weakening of the media. So it's, it, uh, we've often heard of cystic medial necrosis. We hear about all, the, you know, all these you know, elastin degradation from, with bicuspid valves. All of those are attacking the media of the wall, which eventually lead to all of these life-threatening conditions. So um, you, know, you have your choice of imaging modalities. It's important to know which techniques are available at your institution, which techniques um, um, uh, you know, uh, are you're comfortable with, but here, since you have both, you should just know wh which technique you should be able to choose when, and that d depends a lot on patient characteristics. So if you have a patient who is very un un is unstable, or you need a fast study, you know, go for the CT with its very f less than five minutes scan, I mean, less than probably a minute scan time. Um, you know, it's because it's fast, it's a little bit easier on the patients. It's available in all emergency departments. Um, you know, really no issues with claustrophobia and really no problems with metal. Cardiac MRI, consider in those patients who, where you may you need tissue characterization, where you may have a little bit more time to get imaging performed. If you need accompanying functional analysis, example of the heart, in patients who may be allergic to iodine, or, um, um, and now, you know, with the advent of ferromoxetol being used in vascular imaging, maybe in those patients who have GFRs less than 30. And remember that it's radiation-free and therefore can be very beneficial in those patients who are young, pregnant, or the numerous patients who we see for serial imaging. So aortic dissection. Now, um, the basic definition is there's a tear into, uh, in the intima. Blood propagates into the media and creates this double lumen where you have a both a false lumen and a true lumen. So what are some other, other than um, hypertension, what was in the IRAD registry, what were numbers two, three, four, and five causes for dissection? Please, we're, we're, we're small. And it was not mentioned. Uh, yeah, risk factors. Uh, no. What that, I mean, maybe you're associated, but those were not, you know, the patient profiles that you know, num and number one was hypertension. What, uh, who else would you think would be predisposed to aortic dissection? Genetic disorders were number two. So patients with Marfan's, bicuspid valves, ehlers danlos all those. Number three. What's that? Procedural was very good. Was uh, Procedural, if you consider cardiac surgery, was number three, yes. And then iatrogenic was also in there with all the catheters we placed. Uh, any cardiac surgery. Anytime you're, you know, you know, you know how they make those aortotomies into the aorta? All of those that are iatrogenic can cause aortic dissection. And actually, it's interesting. What I learned from that was iatrogenic and cardiac, uh, and, uh, cardiac surgery causes of aortic dissection have a worse prognosis than um, um, you know, the, the, the usual type that we see. Uh, that's kind of interesting. But yeah, you, you nailed all the top uh, four um, etiologies. So, um, you know, when it comes to, we, you know, we, most commonly in the IRAD registry it was in males, generally uh, who are in the, uh, in the older age, and actually in that registry, 73% had involvement of the ascending aorta. We know it's very important to identify where in the aorta the dissection occurs, not only because of its prognosis. We know for the ascending aorta, the risk is one to two percent per hour over the first 22, four hours. So this is a disease that you will see the CT surgeon accompanying the patient to the imaging lab. And I've seen it numerous times because they are not waiting. They see all they want to take a look is where the dissection is and bam, that patient's straight uh, into the operating room if it's the ascending aorta. They're not wasting any time because the risk of rupture and eventual mortality is so high. Descending aortas are a little bit more forgiving. 30-day mortality is about 10%, and we've heard that medical therapy is the way to go there. 
Oh, shoot, I had the causes listed? Okay, no wonder. <laughs> okay, yeah, according to this paper, atherosclerosis, yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, all right, so we went over all the different classified states, uh, the Stanford A, the DeBakey calcifications, and this was just a graph showing you that, you know, if you, uh, in this uh, paper, you know, if they looked at, in, in general, yes, you'd want to see some dilation of the, of the aorta where dissections occur, but be, have your guard up, you know. Not only does this disease require a high index of suspicion, it is really an imaging diagnosis. There's nothing particular in the physical exam or uh, what the patient tells you that will make this diagnosis, this group of diagnosis. It's only imaging. So you have to really be aware. So even if you see a normal aorta, do note that it can occur. Um, so believe it or not, when it comes to the diagnosis of um, uh, dissections, you know, believe it or not, a CT, uh, just a non-contrast CT may be helpful. We do a lot of calcium scores. You know, it, I sometimes may forget to pay attention to this, but when you all are there, pay attention to this. If you see a piece of calcium chunk sitting in the middle of the aorta, there's only one disease that did that. That was aortic dissection. It should not be there. That should be in the wall of the artery. It should not be sitting in the lumen of the vessel. And you'll make your diagnosis as simple with that. And believe me, this hits home because of the amount of calcium scores we do. So, you know, you may very well save someone's life potentially uh, with, a, with a calcium score. How about that? Um, um, and this is exactly what that patient's, you know, when, when we gave contrast, what it looked like. Um, well, so what exactly are, you know, how do you make the diagnosis? We're looking for the double lumen, bar uh, double barreled lumen, which represents the true and false lumen separated by an intimal flap. We'll often see entry tears. We'll often see uh, dilation of the thoracic aorta. But to be honest with you, the, manage uh, the imaging of dissection is way beyond just looking for a flap. As you know, we want to be able to look for uh, uh, complications from this disease. And what are those complications? Those complications include rupture into the pleura, rupture into the pericardium, uh, and organ malperfusion, such as stroke or you know wh whatever visceral structure where the dissection may be involved. So there are other signs that we can use to help us de determine true lumen from false lumen, and this is just mentioned for us. Uh, but this is just an example of where else, once you've identified dissection, where else we look. We have to look at the head and neck vessels. Um, we have to look at, you know, the mesenteric vessels. Uh, these are all important because, you know, these flaps can occlude these um, um, vessels and you can have compromise of, um, of perfusion. Now, that's where MRI is very, very nice because with MRI you actually get functional information. Now, yes, you can theoretically get that with CT. You'd have to gate the entire cardiac cycle, but yeah, potentially you can do that as well. So here's one, uh, here's a complication, um, uh, actually, probably three complicated, four uh, complications on the screen. One, you have um, evidence of fluid within the pericardium, always a, a, a ominous sign. Um, Eric, this patient is hypotensive um, and has a dissection. Do you tap this fluid to save his life? Okay, yeah, that's correct. So the concept being here, if you do a, you've, if you do a pericardiosynthesis, you will drop the resistance to blood extravagating from the aorta, and you know the patient will really just continue to bleed to death. So yeah, do not tap these patients. The treatment is straight to the OR. Um, on the, the right-hand side of the screen, you have a flap that's probably involving the aortic valve and potentially involving the ostium of what, the right coronary artery. These patients, of course, we see so many ST elevation MIs. You know, if you can, late at night, keep in the back of your mind dissection, you know, just if you don't think about it, you'll never make the diagnosis. Will there be anything that will help you make the diagnosis right then and there at night? No, other than uh, some imaging test. Uh, but, you know, um, I, you know, if things are going south, you know, patients not responding appropriately to your management, this may very well be the cause. And then here, an example of a, hemoth hemi uh, uh, a hemothorax with you know, blood um, uh, breaking into the pleural space. Uh, this is just an example of, okay, we'll figure that out. 
Um, but with CMR, as you know, it's a functional technique. We're gaining throughout the EKJ cycle. You can actually see movement of the dissection flap. In our reports, we report now movement of the dissection flap. And, and the reason is it kind of gives you an idea of how old the flap, uh, the, how old the dissection is. The more mobile it is, the more relatively acute it is, whereas the more rigid and thick it seems without mobility, the more chronic it is. Uh, this is just an example with CMR of how you can actually um, observe dynamic obstruction. You can actually create short axis slices of, you know, with the MRA images, uh, uh, it, with the simple MIP images, you know, you may not, because these images may be a mix of systole and diastole, you may not actually see the dynamic obstruction of uh, the uh, branch vessel by the flap. But if you were to play a dynamic image, you would actually see that flap occlude the vessel with associated flow acceleration. And you should know by the IRAD registry that these both CT and CMR and also with TEE are very, very accurate for making these diagnoses. What about intramural hematoma? The disease process is still the same. You generally have this, what all sets it all off is this weakening of the media, this uh, degeneration that you have in the media. But here, the, the, what, what they think happens is you have bleeding um, um, into the media, usually from a ruptured, rupture of the vasovisorum. Um, now, interestingly, uh, unlike dissection, which was more common in men, uh, intramural hematomas are more common in female and typically occur more frequently in the descending aorta. Now, what's interesting is, is that uh, with all the, you know, um, acute aortic syndromes, they can, all they can all progress to the other. So intramural hematomas in two-thirds of the case can go on to present as dissection and rupture, and therefore why we treat ascending intramural hematomas just like we do with as, uh, um, uh, ascending aortic dissections, which is with surgery. Uh, but what's interesting about intramural hematomas is I've read different numbers here. I reported one third, but I've read another report about about 10 percent. So anywhere from 10 to 30 percent of these actually resorb, and I've seen this myself in the CMR lab. Um, these patients, you, you'll you'll find these intramural hematomas. Maybe an elderly patient. They weren't a good surgical candidate. You aggressively control their blood pressure and their risk factors. You image them as little as maybe a week later and uh, you can see complete absorption of the, 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 the bleed into the media. So there is a chance that these can get better, but be wary for complications. <clears throat> now, believe it or not, I'm not saying non-contrast is the technique of choice with any of these diseases, but again, with, you know, since we do so many calcium scores, a learning point for me, blood actually has a very high Hounsfield unit on non-contrast images. I don't know why, Dr. Q but the, it has a, it's, you can see how bright it is. And if you see this concentric thickening, you know, this concentric nature is the, is, is, is the key, uh, this is, would be a sign of an intramural hematoma, or at least a sign for you to get this patient and give them contrast. And this is what the contrast images show. You can see this concentric nature it can be very subtle. You really have to pay attention because this can be very, very easily missed. All it looks like is a little bit of thickening, what you may think is outside the aorta, but this actually thickening of the wall. Um, um, and the keys are for imaging are it doesn't enhance after you give um, IV contrast. You won't see an intimal tear. And unlike dissections, you won't see it spiral down the aorta. It'll just be see this concentric thickening along the wall of the aorta. Uh, and then CMR will display exactly the same image uh, as you see with the CT images. <clears throat> now, what are some high-risk features? High-risk features are here if they say, you know, ultralight projections, aneurysmal dilation of the aorta, focal contrast enhancement, intramural thickness greater than 16 millimeters. These are, these are ones that, you know, more risk for problems. Penetrating aortic ulcers, uh, Dr. Q very nicely also said was, you know, here you have a plaque that's now ruptured through the intima into the media. And so you have this like, you know, very saccular outpouching into the wall of the vessel. They also are um, not happy. They can progress to aneurysm formation, dissection, rupture, 
in a large portion of the patients. Now, one of the key things is, remember, these are very strongly associated with atherosclerosis, and therefore, atherosclerosis is usually associated with the descending thoracic and abdominal aortas, and therefore, their predilection for those sites. So here is an example of um, a, a PAU, penetrating aortic ulcer, where you have this outpouching of contrast beyond the, the normal wall of the aorta into the media. They're focal, they're wide-mouthed, they look like a mushroom, I guess. And, um, 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 and you can see the predilection always here for the arch or the descending aorta where there's accompanying atherosclerosis. Um, um, of, obviously, if you see this, some people believe that these can be nidises of, I mean, that because, you know, they can be nidises for dissection, so look for dissection flaps. They may be a nidus for um, an intramural hematoma, so look at the rest of the wall of the artery, and you can see here that thickening again against the medial portion of the aorta there, that um, um, against the contrast that you have to be looking out for here, either dissection or IMH. So here's just what a PAU again looks like. You've, you've seen this in some of the other slides, but this w patient was imaged in a brief period of time and went on to develop a complication, another complication, which is development of an aneurysm. Um, okay, so uh, this was just a quick slide showing that you know dissections and pro are very common after. Um, uh, any sort of cardiac surgery because of the manipulation to the aorta. And this was just a slide for those, I don't think I, I probably will never see an acute dissection. We're not a level one trauma site. I mean, not a dissection, a transection of the aorta. More than likely, I've seen one, one maybe, of a chronic one of a patient, you know, who reported an accident many, many years earlier and came in and had imaging and, you know, you, you, you find evidence of an old tr transection and they live to tell the story. So uh, this is kind of how it's described. It's usually caused by deceleration. It usually occurs right around the isthmus and, you know, it's really just a break or a tear of the aorta. Um, okay, so a little bit about treatment and management. Um, uh, it's very simple. Um, of so when it comes to treatment, it's very, very aggressive control of blood pressure. But the first agent to reach for is a beta blocker. And the reason for that is you want to decrease DPDT or the force of the ejection. Uh, uh, force of the ejection. So first drug that you should reach out for is a beta blocker. If beta blockers are unsuccessful in controlling the blood pressure, and that means a blood pressure less than 120 systolic, then you reach out for vasodilators, such as IV nitroprusside or whatever you want to use, cardine, you know, et cetera. And you never want to use for a drug, a vasodilator first. It's very, very important. And y'all, this will be a board question guaranteed, and I'm sure you'll be taking care of these patients in the uh, FICU. Uh, you never want to reach for the vasodilator first is because that actually increases sheer stress. It increases the DPDT. So you want to control DPDT. If the blood pressures are not controlled by beta blockers, then you then want to proceed with vasodilators. Very important to also control pain. As you know, that leads to catecholamines and adrenaline. That only heart rate goes up, you know, contractility get, uh, goes up, blood pressure goes up, got to get control of pain. And then just the treatment, we've, uh, Dr. Q hit on all of this. Stanford, it just Stanford's are the most easiest to remember, Stanford A. Surgery, if it involves the ascending aorta, you have to prevent the risk of complications such as rupture and very, very high risk of death uh, with a mortality of 1% to 2% per hour. Stanford B's, more forgiving, 10% at 30 days. Treatment is medical. That includes blood pressure and close monitoring. Close monitoring means looking for complications. What are complications? Continued intractable pain, uh, expansion of the aorta, and end organ malperfusion. So, um, and this was Dr. what Dr. Q had uh, hinted on. These patients are not done once you've made the diagnosis, treated them acutely. Unfortunately, they often face a lifetime worth of imaging. There are a lot of, um, this is just a slide by the guidelines showing you the frequency of a repeat imaging, and you can see it's very frequent, as, as minimal as every year. 
um, and, and you know, and, and usually with some three-dimensional technique, uh, because you are looking for complications and you're looking for expansion of the aorta and the need for surgery. And the most important thing is, you know, yes, uh, these, you know, that uh, have have radiation. On, in the back of your mind, yes, they have a higher risk of dying from some complication rather than radiation, but if you have a patient who's stable and you're following something, you know, think about CMR where you, know, you don't expose these patients to radiation over and over and again. On the flip side of that, I can tell you we have uh, our dual source scanners where we're doing flash imaging or imaging with a very high table speed, a very high pitch. And I can tell you, I can, you know, do, you know, uh, you know at least a, a full thorax CT, maybe one, two millisieverts, you know, right patient size, things like that. So, you know, even there we've significantly improved. Um, so, I, I mentioned it. What about cost? Is MRI, I guess, patients? Well, yes. Yeah, so classically, if you look at the data, Dr. Q, they say, MRI is more expensive than CT. But I think in all reality here, in, in our institution, you know, you know. Uh, you know, in days, when yeah. the insurance is going to pay you, and then I would say, yeah. I mean, maybe a little more. One question is, when you're following these type threes or type ones that were converted to type three after surgery, what are the criteria for elective intervention in terms of expansion? Is there, are there some magic numbers there? That's a great question, Dr. Q. Um, I'm not sure. I'll be. I'll fess up right there. Um, is it a rate of expansion? Is it an absolute value? From my understanding, talking to when I when I read these studies with Jean, is that it's definitely a rate of expansion, and I believe they're using the same cutoffs as a native aorta. So we're on five. Five point five for the descending thoracic aorta. You know, uh, unless they have some congenital abnormality. I mean, uh, genetic abnormality. But that, that has been my impression because uh, whenever we've reported sizes and we report sizes routinely, I will call them up when I see it hit that threshold and they're appreciative of that. I guess the other question is, what percent of these patients within, uh, let's say, a three-year interval end up needing an elective intervention? Yeah, yeah that's good. Do we know that information? Uh, Stay tuned next year. <laughs> I'll find out. These are great questions. I'm not sure. Any questions? <laughs>